I'd like to have Ms. Leslie Crow come and talk and share. She's one of the lawyers at the Baker Ripley Center, share some of her experience. Formerly neighborhood centers. Uh, we serve refugees, asylees, uh, crime victims, victims of domestic violence, human trafficking, um, SIVs, uh, those translators that worked for, with our military in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit, I'm going to give you some legal background about some of the things some of my colleagues have been talking about. Um, and then I also have some ideas about how um, we as lawyers and, and doctors can work together to help these populations um, because there, there is a huge need um, really now more than ever in, in our country and, and in the world. Um, so to start with, the legal defini definition of a refugee or an asylee is a person that's outside of their country due to a well-founded fear of persecution based on their race, religion, national origin, particular social group, uh, or political opinion. Uh, the difference between refugees and asylees is refugees are identified by the UNHCR um, uh, or referred by, by American Embassy possibly um, and then screened outside of the United States, identified as a refugee, um, they're assessed to see if they can move back to their country. They usually go through about two years of screenings uh, for security checks including fingerprinting, retinal scans, multiple interviews by uh, members of the UNHCR and also if they're planning to be resettled in the United States um, by our own, um, our own uh, security apparatus, so uh, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, um, all of these agencies are going to be involved to make sure that uh, we know who we're letting in. So um, this used to be a very non-controversial program until very recently, unfortunately. Um, where now we have politicians claiming we have no idea who these people are, um, and that's just not the case. So to hear people say, you know, we don't know who these refugees are, they could be, you know, they could be dangers to us, um, I, I think just is really not uh, a well-founded <laughs> opinion uh, based on the facts. So um, I just wanted to point that out. If, if you don't trust the refugee system, if you don't trust refugees coming to the United States, you really shouldn't trust any immigrant coming to America because they are the most thoroughly screened of any immigrant that, that touches our soil. Um, asylees are people that have come here either with a visitor visa or possibly um, managed to be smuggled in and then they apply for asylum um, either by presenting themselves to Border Patrol, um, like Dr. Griffin was explaining, uh, or they uh, affirmatively apply with USCIS, which is one of our immigration agencies, and say, hey, I'm here, these are the reasons I'm afraid to go back, um, and um, this is what I'm afraid of, and they, they ask for asylum here. Um, and this is founded in international law. International law actually um, requires all signatories to the UN conventions not to return people that have proven that they have that kind of a well-founded fear. So um, anybody that's concerned with human rights uh, in general should be concerned with what's happening in the world right now, what's happening at our own borders in our name, um, and what's, uh, you know, what's happening with our refugee program. Uh, we were slated to accept 110,000 refugees this fiscal year, um, and due to an executive order, we will now be accepting um, 50,000 or less at a time when there are at least as many displaced people in the world uh, as during World War II. So, um, in my opinion, this is a time when America should be stepping back from this crisis. Um, you know, we really should be leading, in my opinion. So, like I said, the situation at the border um, should concern anyone that, uh, that is concerned with human rights. There are massive access to counsel issues, especially in these, these family detention centers. So I read a statistic recently that said, uh, especially in terms of asylum cases, uh, people that are applying for asylum from detention, meaning they're already in deportation proceedings, uh, have about somewhere between a one and three percent chance of winning their case without an attorney. And these detention centers are in the middle of nowhere. Um, there is no right to counsel in immigration law like there is in criminal law. So we've all heard, you know, the Miranda rights, right? If you're accused of a crime um, and you can't afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you. That's not the case for immigrants, generally, and for people seeking asylum in this country. 
So they've got to find a, a pro bono attorney that's willing to help them for free. Um, and not only that, but to drive maybe multiple hours to one of these family detention centers uh, and make an asylum case for them. So uh, there's just terrible challenges to, to proving that kind of case. We are absolutely violating international law every day by sending back people with legitimate claims that just did not have the opportunity to bring that case because they didn't have the access to counsel that they needed. Um, so, like I said, everybody should, should be concerned about that um, if you're concerned with international law. We're also violating the Flores Agreement on a daily basis, like, like Dr. Uh, Griffin was explaining. The Flores Agreement, just to give you a really brief overview, I'm not an expert on this, but um, many years ago, a case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, ended up in a settlement where a lot of groups were suing the government because they felt it was inappropriate to have um, families, including very young children, in these atrocious uh, prisons, is really what they are. So uh, they agreed that children, um, and especially mothers coming with, with children, should be released within 72 hours. Um, unaccompanied children should go to the Office of Refugee Resettlement rather than going into these jails. Um, and women and children should be um, should be released within 72 hours, if possible, um, you know, to, to be able to bring their case, to be able to try to fight their case. Because like I said, it's extremely difficult to try to fight your case from, from detention. So recently the Texas legislature was considering a bill that would um, license these prisons as child care facilities and actually let them bypass a lot of those regula regulations that normal child care facilities have. Um, so again, anybody that's concerned with the rights of children should be concerned about this. Luckily that bill didn't pass, but um, just barely. So please, you know, keep watching that. Um, so anyway, after that really dire <laughs> explanation of, of our situation, um, I, I do have some ideas about how you as medical practitioners can help us. So uh, at this stage, especially when we have uh, an asylum client or a domestic violence survivor, a human trafficking survivor, a survivor of torture, um, trying to prove their case. You know, often they don't come with, with documents, with photos of, of exactly what happened to them. Um, and we've, all, we've got to sort of build a case out of thin air. And one of the things that can really help are um, number one, mental health evaluations. Um, so if there are any mental health professionals in the room, uh, this is a huge need and often something that our clients can't afford. Um, another thing that can really help are what are called forensic medical examinations. And any doctor can do this. Um, you know, sometimes we have clients that have, have injuries that, uh, that we need to try to document. Um, and what a doctor can do is say, yes, you know, I believe this, this injury is consistent with this kind of a, um, you know, this, this kind of torture or you know whatever it is um, so you know it's we need some piece of documentation to help to help prove that kind of a case um, another another area where uh, our clients really run into a barrier is when, when we have, once we actually have you know won their case or, or in the case of refugees after they've come to the United States to be resettled um, after a year they're eligible to get a green card refugees and asylees and that requires a medical exam because the government has to uh, be assured that they don't have any terrible contagious diseases. Um, and those medical exams can run up to about $400, which you can imagine for refugee families uh, can be pretty unaffordable. So uh, any doctor can apply to get certified to do those medical exams. And if, if anyone here is, is interested in doing those on a pro bono or a low bono basis, especially for our refugee families or our asylee families, uh, that would be hugely helpful. Another, uh, another area where we, we find ourselves in need of, of a medical opinion is in the uh, citizenship context. So when people are ready to apply for citizenship, generally they have to speak English, they have to pass uh, a very difficult civics and history test. And you can imagine for, um, for people with mental illnesses, for uh, elderly people that are having cognition issues, uh, that's just not realistic for them to be able to pass that kind of a test. So there's a special form that, again, any medical doctor can fill out to explain why, uh, why they couldn't pass that test, what their limitations are. 
um, and it can allow people that otherwise wouldn't be able to qualify for citizenship to get their citizenship. And this actually is, can also be an issue with continued access to care, because there's, there's also a law that affects um, people that get disability. Um, and if they are non-citizens, that disability, um, including the automatic Medicaid renewals that come with that, will be cut off after seven years if they don't become citizens. So for people that couldn't pass the citizenship test because of a mental health disability, um, you know, if they didn't have a pro bono attorney to help them navigate that process and they couldn't afford a doctor to help them get that certification that they couldn't pass that test, citizenship would be unattainable, they could get kicked off of their disability, which often families rely on if you've got a situation where you've got to care for a family member full time, you're not really able to work. Um, so that can be hugely impactful for our families that have severe disabilities. Um, the other area where mental health evaluations can really help us are in our work with uh, asylum seekers and crime victims, domestic violence victims. Again, sometimes uh, you know abusers or, or criminals choose their victims and they choose you know the time and opportunity to um, to victimize people. Often, not you know when people have have their camera phones out. So um, any kind of additional supporting evidence that we can get from a mental health professional saying you know these are the symptoms, this kind of these kind of symptoms are consistent with this kind of trauma can really help someone prove their case. Um, and of course people that are undocumented, um, living in the shadows, people that are uh, seeking asylum, who are basically undocumented until they win their asylum case, which can take many, many years, um, have trouble working to, you know, to support the kind of income that's necessary to afford um, a mental health professional to do those detailed evaluations sometimes. So if anyone in the room is a mental health professional or knows a mental health professional, um, please please call me. I have, I have lots of cards to distribute at the end of this if anybody's interested in getting involved. Um, so I think I'll just leave it there. I'm definitely open for questions and outside conversations if anybody wants to help. Thanks.